Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. What we're going to be talking about in this mini lecture, lecture six of week three, is a method of standard additions, which is yet another tool in our arsenal to really deal with quality control in the analytical laboratory. So our mini case for this particular approach is going to be the measurement of lead in wastewater. So now you're working for a company that's discharging its industrial waste into a nearby lake. However, in order to make that discharge legal, you have to guarantee that you don't have any lead in that wastewater. In fact, EPA regulations state that it must be below 100 ppm. And you have a whole set of treatment processes that should lower the concentration of lead to that level. So your job as the analytical chemist is to actually make those measurements on a daily basis to make really sure that you're not discharging lead into this lake. You make up a set of concentration standards ranging from zero up until about probably 200 parts per million. A very nice calibration curve as you can see here. And you calculate a instrument response function and you find that you have a concentration of lead in the water of 25 ppm which is great because that means you're well below the EPA limit and that means your treatment processes are doing exactly what they should be. And you give this data to your boss and say, you know, we only got 25 ppm of lead. And okay, the problem is an environmental group gets some of the water out of your pipe. They analyze it themselves using a methodology called neutron activation analysis, which is actually a very, very specialized technique that involves the use of a nuclear reactor. And they calculate and they calculate a lead concentration of 210. And it's such an unassailable kind of technique that your company is getting sued. So how could you have done this differently? Well, maybe you made a terrible mistake in diluting the calibration standards. OK, um, no, you didn't say you did that right. Uh, how about the environmental group cheated? No, they didn't cheat. Maybe the neutron activation analysis was messed up. No, no, it wasn't messed up. How about that the lead and the wastewater changes with time? Eh, it changes a little bit, but not orders of magnitude. So the last option is actually what happened. There's a matrix effect, and you need to understand what that is and know how to correct for it in the measurements that you make. So let me explain to you conceptually what a matrix effect is when you make an analytical measurement. So below here, as you can see, are two glasses of water. One is a clean glass, maybe of deionized water. You can see right through it. And on the left is maybe a sample of what your wastewater looked like. It's cloudy, it has a lot of total dissolved solids, and there's some lead in there. In a matrix effect, what you know is that the lead, which is represented here by these little red balls, is going to be measured by the instrument differently than the lead that's present in the wastewater sample. There's a whole lot of reasons this could occur. It might be, for example, that the matrix itself has something called humic acid in it. Humic acids can complex to lead, and they would greatly affect the sampling efficiency of how much lead, once it got into the ICP torch, was able to be fully excited in order to be analyzed. So the matrix would cut down on the amount of lead that would be observed. Another very common thing that matrices can do in atomic spectroscopy is change the viscosity of the solution. That actually makes a big difference in the nebulizer and the nature of the droplets that you get out from the system. So you might get very, very different measurements. And an internal standard is shown here over on the left won't necessarily help because the kinds of things that would influence lead may not influence the silver. In some cases, perhaps, but generally not. So you don't really want to rely on an internal standard to help you out with matrix effects. So you really have to think through what you need to do. And what was the real error that was made? Well, the error that was made by the analyst was they took the calibration curve in the presence of clean water. So that calibration curve wasn't actually the calibration curve that represented their samples. So here's their calibration curve. All right, as you can see, it's nice and linear, and that's lead in deionized water. And the assumption was when they got a certain signal out of the ICP AES, that it corresponded to a certain amount of lead. Now, imagine what is the actual case is true, which is that the calibration, the instrument response function of lead and wastewater is very different because the wastewater is cutting down on the sensitivity of the instrument for a variety of reasons. And because of that, a reading of 2,500 millivolts in the DI water would correspond to only 25. But as you can see here, it might correspond to many, many more hundreds of ppm of lead if the slope or the sensitivity 
of the instrument is really drastically altered by a matrix. And so that was really the error. The environmental group was right. There was too much lead in the water, and the calibration curve had not been collected with samples prepared in that matrix. And so what you have to figure out is how do you make your calibration standards that give you that response function identical in their matrix to the wastewater samples. And one of the challenges is how do you get the zero data point? Because your wastewater samples are the actual matrix that you're putting out from your company's waste stream. You can't take the lead out of that, but that's the matrix you need to measure in. So how do you create your dilutions if you really need to measure it in the wastewater matrix itself? We're going to use something called the method of standard addition. So we are going to make up calibration standards directly in our matrix. We're going to take a really big sample, maybe 500 mils, maybe a liter. So method of standard additions, you need a lot of sample. And instead of using deionized water to do our dilutions, we're actually going to use the sample itself. So shown here are five calibration standards that you'll prepare. Normally, you would dilute with deionized water in all these cases. So in this case, though, what you're going to be doing is using the sample itself. So at zero added lead, you're going to have a little bit of lead, whatever the residual lead concentration in the sample will be present. So unlike a normal calibration curve where the zero concentration is true zero, in the method of standard additions, the zero is actually not. It's zero added lead, but you may still have some lead in there you don't know about. That's what you're trying to find. So then you make the next sample, and you add lead on top of the lead that may already be there. And then the next one, you add a little bit more, and the next one a little bit more, and so on. And you make a series of calibration standards on top of whatever lead background you have in your sample. That way, the lead you're adding is experiencing the same matrix as the lead you're interested in in the sample itself. So when you plot the curve, you're going to get hopefully a line that looks something like this. So your signals are going to go up as you add more lead. But the difference is at your zero calibration standard, which is a sample with nothing in it at all. It's your lowest concentration, no intentionally added lead. Rather than getting a zero signal or a near zero signal, you're actually going to get an offset. And that offset is going to correspond to the signal you're going to get from the lead that's present natively in the sample. So when you do it the method of standard addition then, what you're going to get is a calibration curve that you're going to treat in much the same way you treated any of the other calibration curves we've talked about. You're going to calculate the rise over the run, and that's going to give you the instrument response function or the slope of the line. The difference in the method of standard additions is that to get the concentration of your unknown, it's already in your calibration set because the zero added lead actually has some lead in it. So what you do is you take your y-intercept, which is the signal of the sample alone, and you divide that by the slope that you've defined from all the other data points in your line. And when you do that, you're going to be able to calculate the unknown concentration. So when you're running a method of standard additions, then the y-intercept becomes crucially important. You don't actually get the true y-intercept. You assume that's 0. And so the method of and so the method of standard additions is very powerful. And indeed, atomic spectroscopy is one of the techniques that's particularly susceptible to matrix effects because there can be viscosity issues in the sample itself. There can be issues of binding, particularly in environmental samples, to things like humic acids or silica. You might also have issues in the ionization process discovered a much, much different instrument response function. And you would have correctly derived that, yes, indeed, you had too much lead in your wastewater. OK, so just to summarize, MSA is used to handle systematic error caused by matrix effects. The solutions, the calibration standards, are made up of the sample itself. You don't use deionized water. You get a big container of the sample, and you use that to make up your calibration standards. And I will just point out that if you heavily digest your sample with a lot of acid, some matrix effects can be minimized because you'll just be breaking down any organics that are present. So where you see matrix effects really having an effect are actually in groundwater analysis or analysis of environmental samples that you haven't done heavy acid treatments of. You can still get matrix effects even if you have acid digested. They're just a little bit less common. In any case, it's always good to do an MSA approach if you are running a calibration curve and you have enough sample to actually make all of the appropriate dilutions. So with those two caveats, it's a great method to think about. 
and a good one to have in your arsenal as an analytical chemist. Thanks so much. See you next time.